So you know him, you love him, you just saw him on CIO. It's the one and only Dave Kopel from the Independence Institute as well as the DU Law School. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. One of the things that Dave does that I can't do is he likes to write. Apparently he can read as well. Yeah, like that's important. So he's a blogger on something called the Volokh Conspiracy. Tell me about Volokh first before we get to the book. It's V-O-L-O-K-H, Volokh.com. It is the leading uh, law weblog in the uh, solar system. Uh, it's a group web weblog run by Eugene Volokh, who's a uh, law professor at UCLA and there are about 15 of us law professors uh, who write for it. All right, this, this, is, this is a well-respected, un, unlike the Independence Institute webpage, this is actually a webpage that, that academics look at and go, that's important. Well, not only academic, yes, academics look at it a lot, but so does the, uh, the press, which covers legal issues. So, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post or the National Law Journal, uh, those kind of reporters read Volokh a lot uh, to to find stories. Do you do anything on sports? Uh, we occasionally do, actually. One, really? of our, one of our guys is a uh, Spanish soccer nut and, and writes on it. And then we do stuff on, on other things like uh, the data showing. Geeks, geeks. How home, this, home. I deal with this on a daily basis. I want you to know this. Home Spanish. field advantage exists because referees get bi are biased and intimidated by the crowd, and that's what there was a, a blog entry about that, about the study showing that that is the, the true, true cause of home field advantage in sports. It's a good thing you have a lot of liquor in your office and you're bad at golf, otherwise this would never work. All right, tell me a little bit about what happened during the Obamacare, and this, this book, The Conspiracy Against Obamacare. This website actually ended up being a, a touchstone for the case that went forward to the Supreme Court and the lower courts. Tell, tell me exactly how all that works. So when Obamacare was being proposed, the proponents of it, uh, as well as sort of the uh, traditional law school elite, you know, the Harvard-Yale crowd, said, oh, Obamacare is obviously constitutional. There's no possible real constitutional argument against it. And we disagreed with that. And we started blogging and writing on that and talking about the legal theories. Uh, and this is where the intellectual background that built the case against Obamacare happened. One of our bloggers is Randy Barnett, a Georgetown University law professor, who ended up being one of the leading lawyers on the Obamacare, anti-Obamacare cases. And as it turned out, when it got to the Supreme Court, uh, we won on most of the issues we talked about. Except, uh, except the big one, which was the tax. But I, I want to get into that for a second. But the way your world works is so different than what I'm used to and is something going to pass the legislature? Will the citizens vote it up or vote it down? What I, what you take a look at is the legal issues and those legal issues percolate. It's not cut and dry when it comes to lawsuits. It, it has all this area of gray and things like what, what you, what's been reproduced in this book is part of that process of lawyers and scholars and courts bouncing things back and forth. Yes, and the, uh, when the Obamacare individual mandate was created, for example, you had people like Akhil Lamar of Yale University and, and lots of others saying, oh, no, nobody except nuts like Clarence Thomas could possibly think that it's unconstitutional for Congress to use its power to regulate interstate commerce in order to force people to buy a particular product within a single state, like insurance. And we said, no, that's really not so obvious from the cases. If Congress does get away with this, it would be an extension going beyond where the Supreme Court has ever allowed Congress to go before. All right, and, so and it turned out we were right, and we won that part of the case five to four. Let's talk about the case and your part in it and your colleague at Independence Institute, Rob Nadelson, and, and all your colleagues here. You put in a, an amicus brief, which I think had an amazing amount of leverage in what, what was finally done. In the long, in the shorthand, when Obamacare came to the Supreme Court, they said it is legal to tax people if they don't buy insurance. And that's a way to manipulate or to incentivize people to buy this. Right. But you can't force people to buy it. The Interstate Commerce Clause doesn't work, but the Taxation Clause does. 
Do I have that part right? That's exactly right. But the, and the difference is having it be part of the tax power really cripples the coerciveness of the individual mandate because, and it, as just Chief Justice Roberts said in his opinion, you can't run a tax in a way that makes it into a criminal penalty disguised as a tax. So you couldn't penalize people or tax them $25,000 for not buying Obamacare bad quality insurance. The tax has to be at a level, a low enough level so that it looks like a real tax. You can't imprison people uh, for not buying insurance, which you could if it was under the commerce power, you could imprison people for not doing but it. You can imprison them for tax evasion, can't you, if you don't pay your penalty? Yes, that, that's right. You have to pay the tax. But as it turns out in Obamacare, the only way they could even get the, the tax aspect of it through was it's not something that actually gets added to the taxes you owe and you have to write a check for this additional amount. The only way the tax is collected is if you overpaid in the previous year and you're entitled to a refund and oh you didn't buy your Obamacare uh, they can take the tax out of your refund that's the only collection mechanism that exists right, so there, there, there were some real huge victories for free markets and limiting federal government in the Obamacare decision even though on this big part of forcing people to buy insurance on the threat of being taxed if they don't there were some amazing things that happened, and, and a lot of it had to do with the back and forth of you and your colleagues and the Vault Conspiracy. Uh, tell me a, about some of those. Talk first of all about Medicaid and the extortion that the feds were going to try to use to the states. One of the things we wrote about was to say that you can't coerce states to participate in a federal program. You can make it attractive for them to do so, but you can't force them. And so when you have the, the, Medica the gigantic change in Medicaid which Obamacare created. The statute said if states, if you don't go along with this huge change in Medicaid that will greatly expand and transform what Medicaid really is, then not only will we not give you our part of the money for the expansion, we'll also cut off all of your old Medicaid money. And for states that's like 10 or 20 percent of their budgets. So and in other words, we're going to expand Medicaid under Obamacare if you don't play ball with us, state, not only won't we give you the new money for the Obamacare expansion of Medicaid, the Medicaid that we're paying for right now, we're going to hold that hostage. You're not even going to get that. And Exactly. And on the Volokh conspiracy uh, website, which uh, has excerpts in this reproduced in this book, we said, no, that's unconstitutional. That's too coercive. It violates our reading of prior Supreme Court cases and we ended up winning that part of the case seven to two. And you put together an amicus brief along with Rob Nadelson at Independence Institute that really worked on the Medicaid portion of, of the Obama case. Not too many folks did that. They focused on the Commerce Clause. Why did you and Rob decide to, to focus in on that? Because the, the other Volokh writers had done such a good job of setting out the Commerce Clause theories, uh, which again they won on, uh, that we wouldn't be adding any value. So what we did was we focused on what Rob's great expertise is, which is the original meaning and structure of the Constitution, and showed how the Medicaid mandate uh, was a huge violation of the Constitution structure, which leaves states with some of their sovereignty so that they can't be coerced. And the core of sovereignty is the ability to control your own taxing and spending. How many justices agreed with you on, on that reading? Seven. Seven, not not a not a close decision. Not, no, not five four. But this seven seven judges. Yes, uh, which really knocked a leg out of the coercive power of the federal government to hold back uh, uh, tax money from from states. This is a permanent and huge long term win because it means that new federal programs going forward, the Congress can't can say, well, if you want to do this new program expansion, we'll give you some money to help with it and you can join in if you want, but we can't order you to do it and we can't tell you uh, that if you refuse to join the new program, we'll take away your money from some old program. Anything else that happened in that, that landmark decision that free marketers like, like me would be excited about? The, a very important clause in the Constitution is the necessary and proper clause which basically says Congress can do what is necessary and proper to carry out the other powers which uh, the Constitution grants. Because in significant part the, the brief we did with Rob's writing about the original meaning of the uh, necessary and proper clause, all these 
gross expansions and misunderstandings of what it mean means have been stripped away and we are back to the pristine proper original necessary and proper clause as interpreted uh, in the huge 1819 case of McCulloch versus Maryland. All right. I heard none of that. Help me understand in my language. You know, it, uh, necessary and proper says government can do what's necessary and proper to govern and that means they can do all this stuff. What, Exa what, what, what exactly and that that's what the the Harvard Yale uh, Department of Justice axis argued in the case and they lost on that uh, and we said no necessary and proper means if you've you know uh, you got a Congress has the power to set up post offices the stat the Constitution doesn't explicitly say that Congress uh, can punish people for robbing a post office but it's necessary and proper to the existence of a, a post office that you can punish mail robbers but you can't just say because Congress has the power to regulate commerce among the several states that it's somehow necessary and proper to order people within a state to buy a particular product. Necessary and proper is for incidental powers that sort of by implication have to go along with some greater in power. Other words, in other words, in the Supreme Court again agreed with you and your friends on Volek about how to read that that phrase, that clause, so that you just government, the feds couldn't say, well, it's necessary and proper that we order everyone to wear their underwear on the outside of their pants on Thursdays. You know, because that would help underwear sales, sales and stimulate the economy. Right. The point is that the, the power to order people to buy a product is not some minor incident to another power. It is a, what Chief Justice Marshall said, a great, substantial, independent power. And if the people had meant to grant Congress such a great power, they would have said so explicitly. All right. About a minute and a half left. The book, Conspiracy Against Obamacare. You've written a lot of books. This one was more of a compilation of the back and forth between legal experts over the Obamacare fight over, over how long of a period? Over about two years. So right. it's, it's the six of us uh, Volokh.com authors with edited excerpts of our blog entries in the debate. And one of the things that makes it a good book is Oren Kerr, who's a law prophet, George Washington, thought Obamacare was stupid, but he thought it was constitutional. He's one of our bloggers. And so there's a lot of back and forth argument. And one of the real devil's advocate benefits of having him around was he pushed us on the arguments and forced us to refine them and narrow them and, and make them more precise and think about them in more depth. How so much, it's not a one-sided, we all think this kind of book. How much did this work actually impact the Supreme Court decision? Do they read this stuff oh, as well? Absolutely. There, we, we know from conversations that Supreme Court justices and their clerks have had with us that absolutely Volokh.com is, uh, is daily reading uh, for many of them. Really? Well, say hi to them for me next time you write something. <laughs> all right, so this is also a good piece of history which is yeah. you want to know how this debate has evolved this is the book yeah, and it's also about how th the internet has opened up the monopoly on ideas it's not only harvard yale and their elite professors getting quoted in the times there's alternate ways for new ideas to get out there thank you dave and thank you look for us at the independence institute independenceinstitute.org and we'll see you next week